Hi, everybody. This is Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. On Saturday, August 13th, 2016, at 3.30 p.m. in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, two men fled from police on foot after a routine traffic stop. Two police officers pursued the suspects, and after one of these suspects presented a semi-automatic pistol to the police, he was shot and killed. The suspect was told to drop his gun, but didn't comply, leading to the officer firing several times, hitting the man twice, once in the chest and once in the arm. The officer involved was wearing a body camera during the incident. Because lots of people are saying we need cops to have more body cameras in America. Interestingly, a recent study found that, quote, the use of wearable video cameras is associated with a 3.64 increase in shooting deaths of civilians by the police. Aware of this evidence, the officer may become less reluctant to engage in the use of deadly force. Right? If you're recording everything and you believe as a police officer that your use of deadly force is justified and everything's being recorded, you're going to be exonerated. You're more likely to use it, according to this study. From a statement by Milwaukee Police Assistant Chief Bill Jessup, quote, That officer had to make a split-second decision when the person confronted him with a handgun. This is a risk they take every day on behalf of our community. The suspect was a 23-year-old black Milwaukee man with a lengthy arrest record. The suspect's handgun was stolen, having been reported missing after a burglary in March 2016. The owner of the firearm also reported that close to 500 rounds of ammunition were also stolen in the burglary. The second suspect who fled the traffic stop is currently in police custody. Now, seemingly as surely as night follows day, mere hours after the shooting, a group of approximately 200 mostly black protesters gathered and began harassing police officers in response to the shooting. Police cars were pelted with rocks, and one police officer was injured after being struck in the head with a brick. Several vehicles, a BMO Harris Bank branch, a Jet Beauty Supply Company, an O'Reilly Auto Parts store, and even a local gas station were set on fire. As chants of black power and fuck the police were heard throughout the Milwaukee protest. Firefighters were even prevented from extinguishing the fires because of gunshots being fired from the rioters. Now, Milwaukee, of course, is majority black and a Democrat-controlled hellscape in many ways. And um, this is the environment that uh, young people are growing up in, that kids are growing up in. I mean, just imagine being, say, a five-year-old black kid in this environment. You grow up uh, with poverty, with screaming, with uh, lots of casual sex, with um, uh, STDs floating around, uh, which we'll get to in a second. You you grow up with nobody has a history of work. Nobody has the job skills. Nobody has the capacity to tell you how to defer gratification. It's all immediate. And now uh, drugs are all over the place. There's fighting. There's yelling. You barely know anyone who has a father around, which we'll get to again in a moment. You look out the window, and there's cars up on bricks, there's uh, fights, there's shootings. Uh, you might have bars on the window. You're told not to play outside because random bullets might be flying all over the place. This is the kind of hellscape that you grew up in. And you're told by just about everyone in your environment that it's because white people hate you and hate your race. And that is why all these terrible things are happening, that white people wake up in the morning uh, brush their teeth, and their first order of business is fig figuring out how to oppress blacks and keep them poor. And you grow up feeling that you are a prisoner in the land of the free. You grow up feeling that you are trapped and controlled and managed by other people and that the general failures and dysfunctions of your entire environment, of your entire society, of your entire neighborhood are the fault of those evil, rich, white people who just laugh behind closed doors at how badly you're doing. And businesses don't want to come to your neighborhood because they're afraid of these kinds of riots. And uh, if you try to get ahead, if you try to read, if you try to learn, if you try to study, 
what happens is you're called an Uncle Tom, you're called an Oreo, black on the outside, white on the inside. You are told that um, you are a bad person for wanting to improve yourself and an entire entrapping, enslaving dysfunction of negativity, rage, hostility, helplessness, powerlessness surrounds you and infests your mind and your heart. And the solution, of course, if you have promise, is to be told, as one black caller into this show was told, that you better go into politics to make sure you can get political money and power and opportunities for your community. In other words, welding your hopes and opportunities to the grim power of the state is all that you can hope for in terms of improving your society, your community. And you also know that if you act badly, excuses are going to be made for you by the media as a whole because the media wants Democrats to get in power and so every election year they undergo or perform this kind of race baiting and, and goad on these problems and these protests um, to further gin up support for the Democrats. It is a grim environment and we must do something to change it. I'll have some suggestions in a few minutes. Common Council President Ashanti Hamilton said, quote, Our police officers are doing everything they can to restore order. If you love your son, if you love your daughter, text them, call them, pull them by their ears, get them home. Our city is in turmoil tonight. When we get information, we are going to share it with the public. Please allow the process to work. Hmm. Please. Please. Please don't riot. Well, I think if you're already in the situation and context of mind to riot, I don't know that please is going to help. Now, there's lots of video online. You can find it linked in Twitter and you can find it uh, all over the place. Um, video was recorded of black protesters screaming, they're white, get their ass, as white bystanders were cased and terrorized. One black protester in the middle of a violent black mob remarked, They're beating up every white person. He's white. Beat his shit, bitch. As protesters attempted to drag white drivers from their vehicles, where they faced imminent cultural enrichment. I wonder, actually, if, if um, the Department of Justice is going to investigate any of these hate crimes. I'm going to hold my breath until they do. No, I'm not, because that's not going to happen. Several local news reporters were also targeted by the rioters, with one being thrown to the ground and assaulted. Other local news agencies withdrew their correspondents out of concern for their safety. Ah, I don't know, after many generations, it's not all these reporters, but it's the mainstream media as a, media as a whole, after many generations of uh, covering up black crime and black dysfunction and blaming everything on white people, they find that the uh, blacks in this situation are pretty angry and want to attack white people. Huh. It's almost like there's some boomerang involved in that, which I'll figure out at some point later on in my life. One black bystander was interviewed and commented, quote, It's sad because, you know, this what happened because they not helping the black community. Like, you know, the rich people, they got all this money and they're not like trying to give us none. Because apparently earning it is just off the table. Alderman Khalif Rainey said, quote, This entire community has sat back and witnessed how Milwaukee, Wisconsin has become the worst place to live for African Americans in the entire country. Now this is a warning cry. Where do we go from here? Where do we as a community go from here? Do we continue? Continue with the inequities, the injustice, the unemployment, the undereducation that creates these byproducts that we see this evening. The black people of Milwaukee are tired. They're tired of living under this oppression. This is their existence. This is their life. This is the life of their children. Now, what has happened tonight may not have been right. I'm not justifying that. But no one can deny the fact that there's problems, racial problems here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that have to be closely, not examined, but rectified. Rectify this immediately. Because if you don't, this vision of downtown, all of that, you're one day away. You're one day away. You know, from what I saw in the videos, the black people of Milwaukee, at least the young black protesters and other protesters 
they didn't appear to be that tired. They appeared to be quite energized and exiting stores with armfuls of weaves and hair care products. So I don't know, but it does kind of have the flavor of a kind of shakedown, right? So basically it says, give us money or we'll riot where you live. And, um, you know, nice nice neighborhood you got there. Be be a shame if something happened to it. So maybe you'd just like to give us uh, a lot of money uh, so that we can hand it out to the black community because otherwise, um, well, Milwaukee could be your doorstep tomorrow. We are one day away. So this young black suspect was shot after presenting his gun. We'll find out hopefully when the body cam comes out or other video may come out. We'll find out more details. He was shot. Now, let's zoom out just a tiny little bit. Let's put some things in perspective. During a nine-hour stretch of time on Friday evening and Saturday morning, five people died in shooting-related homicides in Milwaukee. Nine-hour stretch of time, Friday evening and Saturday morning. See, Saturday afternoon, this black guy with a criminal record who presents a gun to police gets shot. Everybody goes nuts. Nine-hour stretch. Five people died in shooting-related homicides in Milwaukee. But you see, the reason why nobody gets angry about that, the reason why the media is not about, all about it, the reason why there aren't protesters about that, is that doesn't fit the shakedown model. Protesting that won't get you money and power. Protesting the shooting of a suspect by a cop, that might get you money. And so, who benefits? Follow the money. It's not that complicated. According to data from the Milwaukee Homicide Review Commission, in 2015, there were 145 homicides and 633 non-fatal shootings in Milwaukee. As reported in The Color of Crime, a detailed breakdown of race and crime statistics, quote, Milwaukee records races of suspects in both homicides and non-fatal shootings. In 2014, the most recent year available, blacks were 12 times more likely to be murder suspects than whites. And Hispanics were four times more likely. For non-fatal shootings, blacks were 25 times more likely than whites to be suspects, and Hispanics were 7.6 times more likely. To continue, in Milwaukee, murders were up 65% in 2015, and 91% of the victims were either black, 83%, or Hispanic, 8%. And, of course, if you start from the perspective or opinion that all ethnicities, all races, all cultures are exactly the same, then all discrepancies could conceivably be put at the feet of racism from the dominant white society. However, and we've had lots of experts on uh, this show to talk about this, and we'll, I'll talk about it more at the end, uh, this is not the only reason why these discrepancies might be occurring. I mean, if we look at Chicago, lots of gun control in Chicago, but gun control in Chicago seems to be holding it steady because between a previous Friday afternoon and early Thursday, at least 99 people were shot in the city, 24 of them shot fatally. On Monday alone, nine people were killed in Chicago. That was the deadliest day in Chicago in 13 years. And um, among the wounded that day, a 10-year-old boy shot in the back as he played on his front porch in Lawndale. Was there any rioting or attention paid to this? No, you see, that's black on black. It doesn't gin up support for the Democrats, and it doesn't allow you to fit this shakedown of the general taxpayer into the motif. Now, Milwaukee's poverty rate, 29%, close to twice the national average, and about 40% of the city's black population lives in poverty. Now, what is common in this situation? Is it the skin color? No, it's only 40%. And uh, if you look at the people who graduate, um, the blacks who graduate from higher education, a lot of them come from outside of America, come from Africa or or other places. And so it's not just skin color, as the Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson recently talked about on this show. People are not judging skin color, they're judging behavior, and that's very important. So what's the one thing in common with a lot of these people? Well, what's in common is that the government is in charge of their lives. Well, 
12 years of government education, I guess you could say. Uh, they live in government housing in general, a lot of them. Uh, welfare, food stamps, Medicaid, Obamacare. They live deep in the belly and power of the state. And this is the result. See, everybody says, well, more government spending, more government control, more government programs, more government funding. Dear God alive. Dear God alive. It cannot be that more government spending is going to help this situation because government spending has exploded and escalated since the declaration of the war on poverty that was supposed to solve all of these problems in 1965. Little over half a century of pouring trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars into the poor, into these problems. And this is the result. In 2009, in Milwaukee, 86% of all births to black mothers were out of wedlock. Yay! Milwaukee, number one in the nation for black illegitimacy. Milwaukee has double the national teen birth rate. In Milwaukee, uh, HIV infection rates for gay and bisexual black men approach the rates found in sub-Saharan Africa. In 2009, the Center for Disease Control reported that over 40%, 42% of young black men who have sex with the other men in Milwaukee carry the virus that causes AIDS. Black women in Milwaukee are 15 times more likely to be affected by HIV than white women. The number of new HIV cases in Milwaukee increased 36% between 2003 and 2009. The government is in control of these people's lives. They live in a state zoo, or what Diamond and Silk have called the Democrat plantation. And we've tried this experiment for a little over half a century now. And that experiment is this. I wonder if the government can be your daddy. I wonder if the government can be your husband. I wonder if the government can be your educator. I wonder if the government can be your community. Well, for anybody who's interested in facts, evidence, logic, reason, science, and data, the answer is clear. The government cannot be your father. It cannot be the husband to your children. It cannot be your community. It cannot educate you decently. All it can do is give you the drip, drip, dependence, family-shattering, poison of the welfare state to keep you in relative poverty and disadvantage for the sake of political power. All those who want to grow government wish to grow the livestock who depend on the state. That way you can reliably get people to vote for more and more and more government. More government is the answer? From 1965 to 2008, nearly $16 trillion of taxpayer money in constant 08 dollars was spent on means-tested welfare programs for the poor. Yes, that is $16 trillion of money spent to try and help the poor. You cannot help the poor through the state. Helping the poor is a very delicate situation because some poor you help will get better, and other poor you help will get worse. It's very delicate. You need personal knowledge. It can't come from a check mail from some central agency by indifferent, loathsome, spotty-behind bureaucrats. And here's the thing. This is the, uh, so frustrating. So frustrating. Because we see the road not taken. We see what could have been. The numbers, the statistics are very clear. As of 1965, boom, this is when LBJ decided to trap the black vote into voting Democrat. As of 1965, the number of Americans living below the official poverty line had been declining continuously since the beginning of the decade. And it had dropped by half. The number of people living below the poverty line had dropped by 50% in only 15 years. Think of the enormous stretch of human history. Think of the 50, 100, 150,000 years of human history. Boom! Half the poverty rate in 15 years. Why? Relatively free market and no giant welfare state. Between 1950 and 1965, alone, the proportion of people whose earnings put them below the poverty level had decreased by more than 30%. And here's the key, here's the key. The black poverty rate had been cut nearly in half between 1940 and 1960. Boom! Yeah, there was racism back there. Absolutely. No question. But even in the face of what was 
much greater racism than could be conceived of now or enacted now without the government there to help. Oh, yes, because the black community has benefited so much from the government in the past. Hey, wasn't slavery just this big, giant government program? Yes, it was. Between 1940 and 1960, the black poverty rate was nearly cut in half. What if that had continued? Between 36, 1936 and 1959, in various skilled trades, the incomes of blacks relative to whites had more than doubled. <sighs> the representation of blacks in professional occupations and other high-level occupations grew more quickly during the five years before the launch of the war on poverty than during the five years thereafter. Oh, getting up the hill, getting free. Brother, can we get an income? Can we get a profession? Yes, we can. And then, boom. Oh, no. The blacks are getting self-reliant. Let's go in and get them addicted to the state this time for sure. For good. Well, for the good of the Democrat Party, if not for the blacks, the children, the taxpayers, the future, and just about everybody else. <sighs> So for the next few decades, right after the uh, introduction of the war on poverty, means-tested welfare programs, you know, food stamps, public housing, Medicaid, daycare, and temporary assistance to needy families. Boom! What did it do? It penalized getting married. Getting married, very, very important for having a decent, stable, positive lifestyle and one of the essential ingredients in getting into the middle class and hopefully staying there. So... A mother, generally in the welfare state, gets far more money from welfare if she's a single mother rather than married. Drive out the father of the children, the husband of the wife, through the welfare state. See, once the woman takes a husband, her benefits, boom, instantly reduced by about 10 to 20 percent. Welfare programs for the poor reward the very behaviors that are most likely to keep poor people poor, bribing them to stay dependent on the state so that you can reliably get their votes for the increase in state power. See, if people are becoming self-reliant, they don't need the state. If they're becoming rich, they don't need the state. If they're becoming, if they're keeping their families cohesive, they don't need the state. State, let's just say, it loves to be loved. It likes to be likes. It, need, it needs to be needed. So in the mid-1960s, out of wedlock birth rates were tiny, 3% for whites, 7.7% for Americans overall, 24.5% among blacks. And this is the great tragedy. Because in slavery, where black males were sold across state lines and throughout the epoch of slavery into the early part of the 20th century, most black children grew up in two-parent households. Sorry to be so 3D, but <laughs> this is really important. Most black children grew up in two-parent households. There were studies done just after the Civil War. Most black couples in their 40s had been together for at least 20 years. In southern urban areas around 1880, nearly three-quarters of black households were husband or father present. In the south, in rural settings, that was almost 86%. 86% cohesion in the black family. Now it's 83% of children born out of wedlock. Question, do you think there was a little bit more racism around in 1880 than now? Current year, people. As of 1940, the illegitimacy rate among blacks nationwide, only 15%. That's not even one-fifth of the current figure. As late as 1950, black women were more likely to be married than white women. And only 9% of black families with children were headed by a single parent. The destruction of the black family by the welfare state is the, one of the great central tragedies of modern Western civilization, certainly of American civilization. George Mason University professor Walter E. Williams has put it most powerfully, quote, the welfare state has done to black Americans what slavery couldn't do, what Jim Crow couldn't do, what the harshest racism couldn't do, and that is to destroy the black family. Hoover Institution fellow Thomas Sowell concurs, quote, The black family, which had survived centuries of slavery and discrimination, began rapidly disintegrating in the liberal welfare state that subsidized 
unwed pregnancy and changed welfare from an emergency rescue to a way of life. The cause of the decay of many aspects of black life, uh, it's clear. The statistics are clear, the facts are clear, the arguments are clear. The will to change it is another matter, but, you know, we know you should stop smoking. Will you stop smoking? Well, that's up to you. So, why is this occurring? But this is a shakedown. So predictable. Oh, what happens? Black person breaks the law. Running from a cop is, in fact, against the law. Black person gets shot. Black people riot. Money and political power flow into the black community. The media excuses everything. It says, oh, you see, it's poverty. It's, 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 it's poverty that it causes all these problems. Poverty, you see. Poverty. Bullshit. Poverty doesn't cause crime. Crime causes poverty. Breakdown of the family. Destruction of role models for black youths. Joblessness. Welfare state. That causes criminality. And let's not even get started on the war on drugs and the disaster that has been for the poor by giving them an avenue for money making that is relatively easy to take, that has become cool and glorified in certain aspects of, of uh, culture in America, that is a huge, huge problem. And the war on drugs, there's no war on drugs, it's a war on people. It's not like the marijuana goes to jail, it's people who go to jail. War on drugs sucks people into getting involved in the drug trade, which maybe gets them arrested, which gets them a record, which makes them relatively less employable, the whole thing. The war on drugs is a complete and total disaster. And of course, for the vast majority of American history, or at least a significant majority of American history, you could walk into a drugstore and buy cocaine and heroin. One of the original ingredients in Coca-Cola was cocaine. And um, there was no huge problem. There was no massive drug trade. Uh, it was a prohibition and the drug war that brought organized crime to America and has kept it growing there ever since. So what happens when there's a lot of crime? A lot of illegitimacy, a lot of crime, bad education, and so on. Well, businesses don't want to come to that community. And what happens is any person with any brains gets out, like tries to claw their way out of that community as soon as humanly possible. They're like a ferret in an overturned aquarium. <laughs> Get out! Which is the brain drain away from these communities. Who's left? If poverty caused crime then why were blacks not rioting during the Great Depression? When income, job opportunities cratered, when unemployment was 20, 30, 40% in various areas. Why was there no rioting at that time? No. We hope we can bribe people into being good. Bribing people generally makes them bad. Milwaukee, of course, is a Democrat, Democratic Party stronghold, so... If you like the Democrats, you're going to get more of that. So we've talked about the welfare state. You know what else would be great, what would be really helpful? If the Democrats were really interested in, say, helping the black community. So in Milwaukee, and this is from some years ago, government schools had a 36% graduation rate. But for choice schools, right, where you got a voucher and you could choose, there was a graduation rate of 64%. See, that's almost double almost double. Just by giving the parents a choice on where to send their children to school, you can almost double the graduation rates for government schools or for schools as a whole. The government schools, 36%. For choice schools, 64%. But you see, the Democrats don't want to do that because that would involve empowering parents, disempowering bureaucrats and bad teachers, and they want all of that union money. They want all of that sweet stuff being flowed through a largely involuntary union dues, straight to the coffers of the Democratic Party. So they don't care about the kids. They care about money and power. So, I've done some shows recently on terrorism in Europe. And of course, you know, a lot of Americans are saying, wow, you know, it's really bad over there in Europe with that terrorism and all. It is. U.S. Code of Federal Regulations defines terrorism as, quote, the unlawful use of force and violence against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof in furtherance of political or social objectives. Hmm. That's, uh, 
go through that. Unlawful use of force. Well, of course, rioting is the unlawful use of force and violence against persons or property. Yep. Beating up white people, setting fire to gas stations, burning down auto repair shops. Yeah, that's pretty much persons or property. To intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof in furtherance of political or social objectives. Well, a criminal who steals from you is not looking for anything from the state. But these people who riot and some of their representatives are demanding changes in state policy because of the rioting. They're demanding changes in how policing occurs. They're demanding changes in how much money flows to the uh, community or to their representatives. They're demanding more political power, more political say, more affirmative action, whatever it's going to be. These are specific political objectives being advanced in front of a giant wall of rioting flames. Tell me. I'll check the comments below. I will. Tell me how that is not terrorism. I mean, you set fire to a gas station. I know there's lots of safeguards and all that. If that fire goes down, you're going to have something visible from space, aren't you? So here's the general challenge that remains least spoken of, because I think it provokes a lot of despair and anger, which I understand, but we must respect science. We must respect facts. We must follow the truth wherever it leads. We've got um, experts talking about this. We'll put the links below. You can delve more into this uh, as you see fit. I think it's a very important issue. The mean IQ for blacks in America is roughly a standard deviation, 13 to 15 points below whites. It's about 20 points below East Asians, right? So East Asians commit the least crime, and then whites commit more crime than East Asians, and Hispanics commit more crime than are whites and blacks commit more crime than Hispanics. This all follows IQ. And again, we've got presentations below. You can check out the truth about crime, uh, which goes into this in more detail. All well sourced. You can get the facts below. But this is something we need to talk about. Now, is it cultural? Is it genetic? There's arguments for both. It's probably a mix. But the reality is nobody at the moment knows how to change either the culture uh, or the genetics that may be contributing to this IQ gap. This is one of the fundamental problems that needs to be understood and needs to be addressed and needs to be discussed. We need to have an honest conversation about race, race and ethnicity. That includes the science of IQ and the science of human biodiversity. What solution we come out of from that, I don't know. But I will tell you this, that the IQ gap between blacks and whites have, has narrowed a little bit since the 1970s. And look how well the black community was doing before that, how much better things were getting for them. Now, who knows how far that process could have gone, the process that was so savagely interrupted by the Democrat LBJ in 1965 in the war on poverty. Who knows how far that march out of poverty and degradation the black community could have achieved had it not been so interrupted, savagely curtailed, cut down at the knees, and the emerging black middle class and the emerging black wealth and independence was switched and changed and broken up and sold for parts for the Democrat Party establishment. Who knows how far that could have gone. I hope, I hope, I hope we can turn things around. I hope in America you can fix these terrible policies that have destroyed the black family and have trapped the entire set of generations of blacks into unrelenting, unredeemed poverty. Because I'd love to see how great the black community could do. And I hope, I hope, I hope that in America, you take the steps so that we can all find out.